Bonne locale, my garden of roses. Because of the amount of weight on the Russia discussions in the Senate Intel Committee's hearing on worldwide threats, I decided to give myself a little bit more time to prepare for that one. Instead, we're going to spend just a few minutes discussing uh, another major topic addressed at least in the introductions by the Director of National Intelligence for my second video today, terrorism and the nations which fund terrorism. Honestly, it's no wonder my videos are unmonetizable on YouTube. Specifically, we're going to be addressing Pakistan and Iran in these videos. Nations which may seem weak or ineffectual in many ways, but pose just as much a threat as North Korea, if not more, due to their influence over organizations like the Taliban, Hezbollah, Al-Qaeda, and even the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant, as well as the so-called cyber and nuclear threats these two paranoid Islamic states present. With Iran posed to be nuclear capable within a year, and the already nuclear-equipped Pakistan aiming to design tactical nuclear weapons for short-range purposes, as well as the terrorist element which aims to steal or gain to use any weapons they can get their hands on, whether they be conventional, biological, or God forbid, nuclear. Iran and Pakistan stand as perhaps the most unstable powder kegs in the world, ready to explode at any moment they feel like Allah or their sovereignty is threatened by those they hate most. And who do they hate the most? Well, aside from Israel and India, the United States. Although it's important to also note, they do hate each other, but more on that in a bit. The greatest threat the intelligence community sees coming from these locations is their sponsorship of Shia-related terrorism, which not only causes continual terror attacks being carried out in Afghanistan, Syria, Iraq, and other locations, but has also created backlash in the form of Sunni-related terrorists, not only in Afghanistan and Syria, but also here in the United States, so-called homegrown terrorists. A threat extremely difficult to detect that leads to events like the shooting at a nightclub in Orlando, Florida less than two years ago. The ongoing war between the Sunni terrorists, who stake their claim with the nearly destroyed Caliphate of ISIL, and Shia terrorists, who remain well-funded through the assistance of Iran, draw in many sympathizers from not only both sides of the religion, but all over the world. A system of propaganda which portrays these groups as victims of external influence in the region provides them with a growing number of radicalized individuals who leave the West to join the ranks of these terrorists and add to the problems faced by our military and intelligence communities. And while I group Pakistan and Iran together, it's important to recognize that in the religious war between Sunni and Shia, the war for the Middle East, these two are actually greatly opposed, with Iran supporting the Shia Islamic terror groups of Hezbollah, Hamas, the Houthis, Islamic Jihad, and the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, and Pakistan supporting the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, ISIL, and the Haqqani Network. In addition to terror threats, Iran poses the most powerful militaristic threats as well, hosting, at least in the region, hosting the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, as well as the largest missile force in the ballistic missile force in the Middle East. Iran ex intends to expand its influence over the region, especially with regards to Syria, Iraq, and Yemen in the coming years hoping to exploit the fight against ISIS in order to translate battlefield gains into military installations of their own within Syria and Iraq and expand their offensive capabilities along the borders of Israel and Saudi Arabia, as well as move the heavily contested Iraq under their control by providing Shia supporting troops with weapons and artillery. And with Americans supporting Kurdish terrorists of their own, Turkey has been moving further and further into Syria, deepening the threats posed not only to our military, but the stability of the region as a whole. Meanwhile, on the other side of Afghanistan, Pakistan continues to work to rebuild their underground tunnel system, which has been used for decades now to secretly move weapons, people, 
drugs, and money to and from Pakistan into the hands of terrorists, who strike out, as we've seen in the beginning of this year, in terror attacks in Kabul, as well as along the India-Pakistan border. With the ongoing sometimes hot and sometimes cold war that exists between the nuclear-armed Pakistan and nuclear-armed India, troops are, to this day, mobilized and recalled by the tens of thousands to stare at each other over the contested lands between the two nations. And when Pakistan isn't challenging India, it has intelligence operatives working to destabilize Afghanistan as well as the United States through direct espionage as seen in the Imran Awan situation, as well as through support from and with China when it comes to the distribution of drugs, the um, rather large problem of human trafficking that centers around Pakistan as a rather central location for it, and other rather fucked up things, honestly. Talking of Pakistan specifically, we see a place where, as long as you're doing it for the glory of Pakistan, the glory of Sunni Islam, you can just about get away with anything. I brought up Imran Awan before because his family is well connected within Pakistan and has been shown to, you know, be involved in human trafficking and the taking of, uh, body parts, human harvesting of body parts for sale on markets. And not only that, we often get, uh, you know, like opiates uh, that are grown in Afghanistan and then processed in Pakistan in the United States as generic drugs sold out of Mexico. And this problem is one that I rarely see addressed, and certainly wasn't addressed in the hearing, but is a problem posed by the, to the United States by Pakistan, and only intensified by the fact that China invests heavily into Pakistan's uh, medical research and medical development fields for these specific purposes. They gain a certain amount of, well, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, plausible deniability by putting the money in the hands of quote-unquote hospitals in Pakistan, which do little more than kidnap people, steal their, their fucking organs, and then sell them on the black market, or use that money to fund opium farms in eastern Afghanistan, move them through the tunnel systems that exist along the borders, although it's important to note that around, was it March and April of last year, we did drop the mother of all bombs on that tunnel system, crippling it greatly, but not finishing it off. We also burn entire opium fields in Afghanistan when, of course, the CIA isn't taking control of them for our own purposes. The biggest problem with uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan is that we have too much in the way of interest there, especially the CIA, which is probably a major reason why it wasn't discussed very much in the hearing with the Senate committee, at least in the unclassified hearing. The CIA uses opium grown in Afghanistan to buy and sell weapons to provide to quote-unquote freedom fighters like the Kurds, the Kurdish people who are fighting with us on our side in Syria. Uh, these were also used uh, to move weapons from Libya to Syria as far back as the Benghazi situation uh, that Hillary Clinton still has not properly accounted for. The entire situation is pretty much a clusterfuck. And in order for us to get past it, we need to end these wars and not continue fighting these wars. But we don't really have much of a choice in that matter either. Because we're not at war in Pakistan. We're in war in Afghanistan, despite the fact that Pakistan is funding Al-Qaeda and 
ta the Taliban in Afghanistan is supporting them so long as they fight on the side of Sunni Islam, as long as they fight for the right pro uh, successor to Allah, uh, excuse me, the right successor to Muhammad in the eyes of Allah as far as the interpretations of uh, Islamic scholars go. And as long as we have Iran on one side pushing and supporting terrorists, yes, on their western borders, moving into Syria, and Pakistan supporting terrorists in Afghanistan, we're going to be seeing Hezbollah, Hamas, we're going to be seeing these, okay, not Hamas, excuse me, uh, the Houthis, we're going to be seeing these groups expand, move around the borders of um, Iran, and start the problem is just going to balance back and forth it's extremely unstable and it's further destabilized by the fact that these this one nuclear power pakistan and near nuclear power iran use their money to buy weapons and support the efforts of terrorists this is the problem we have at hand and while it's very difficult to talk about in un unclassified settings before before the Senate, this is why they pose such an amazing threat. Add to that the fact that they have impressive militaries of their own, which can stand their own, at least in posing a cold threat against their neighbors, let alone keeping us out of the region because we have interests in those countries and won't directly declare war on them, even when they send spies to enter our country and work as assistants in our government for our senators and re representatives. And you have a situation that is such a grand threat that even the intelligence community doesn't know where to start talking about it. I will catch you next time, folks. Mm -hmm.